Historically, Lake Okeechobee has been shrouded in mystery. Early explorers heard rumors of what Native Americans called Big Water, but did not believe it existed. The interior of South Florida was an impenetrable swamp, and explorers thought tales of the Big Water were just a myth. Almost five centuries later, Lake Okeechobee remains elusive. Within the lake's simple outline is a vast and largely unknown treasure. Along with its dynamic ecological and social values, the lake offers captivating panoramas that few have ever seen. Many people have driven within yards of the lake, but never knew it was there. A 35-foot-high dike surrounds it, hiding it from view. Lake Okeechobee is the largest lake in the southeastern United States and encompasses 730 square miles. It is so large, it has a profound effect on local weather. Summer breezes blowing off the lake over the warmer land often produce clouds and rain in a donut-like pattern over the lake. A wetland zone or area between high and low water levels surrounds a natural lake. This wetland filters nutrients and sediments from the water, provides nursery areas for fish, and a habitat for birds and wildlife. It also helps balance water chemistry and may provide water storage and flood protection. A huge wetland once encircled Lake Okeechobee. But in an effort to turn the marshy soil into agricultural lands, early farmers built small muck levees along the lake's southern shores to hold back the water. Then, following major hurricane disasters in the 1920s, Construction began in 1930 to enclose the lake behind a substantial barrier, the Herbert Hoover Dyke. Subsequently, the lake became much smaller in size and more shallow than it was in the 1800s and before it was diked. And more importantly, reduction of the vast and unconstrained wetlands that once encircled the lake resulted in a loss of the beneficial functions they perform. With flooding a concern, the Central and Southern Flood Control Project provided for construction of major canals to shunt excess water to the coast and to wells along the coast not previously connected to the lake. These canals replaced natural streams, marshes, and sloughs. Lake levels, once determined only by rainfall, now became partly controlled by man. Improvements in flood control resulted in intense agricultural development around the lake. Sugarcane and winter vegetables were planted to the south of the lake, and dairy farms and cattle ranches were established to the north. These activities produced unnaturally high concentrations of nutrients, especially phosphorus, which flowed or were pumped into the lake. The west side of the lake, where there was once open water, became a new wetland area, now inside the dike and reduced in size. Much of it still functions as a healthy marsh, but many areas have been invaded by the Mataluka tree and torpedo grass, exotic plants that crowd out native vegetation needed by wildlife to survive. Extreme variations in water levels have equally damaged the marsh, High waters and wind uprooted and destroyed grassy beds, and droughts baked the marsh and also subjected it to invasive exotic plants.
While human activities have degraded Lake Okeechobee, many of its social and economic values remain. Located between the Kissimmee River and the Everglades, the lake receives water from a 5,000 square mile basin and feeds the remnant Everglades. It waters agricultural areas, quenches the thirst of millions of residents, and provides cross-state navigation, recreation, flood protection, and habitat for fish and wildlife. The lake is now suffering from a multitude of injuries. Yet with a passion to survive, the liquid heart of Florida struggles to keep its beat. As a component of South Florida's dynamic ecosystem, the lake must be rescued. Three major problems plague the lake. High nutrient loads, especially phosphorus, that have accumulated within lake sediments and continue to flow into the lake from outside. Water levels, partly controlled for multiple purposes, that fluctuate between extreme highs and lows, and invasive exotic plants that crowd out native plants and reduce wildlife habitat. The Florida Legislature, in recognition of these problems, passed the Lake Okeechobee Act. This act provides an umbrella for all restoration activities and builds upon decades of planning, research, and experience to provide the remedy. In addition, the comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan that will provide water for the Everglades as well as growing populations and industry recognizes Lake Okeechobee as vital. The plan relies heavily on new water storage and water supply projects to buffer and relieve the lake. Restoring the lake involves vigorously pursuing water quality improvements at the farm level, in the regional watershed, and within the lake itself. It mandates better management of water levels and calls for increased regional water storage and exotic plant control. At the farm level, projects are testing ways to bind phosphorus to the soil, restoring on-farm wetlands, determining the optimum feed for cattle, and the appropriate number of cows per acre. Other projects control how manure and sludge are applied. And at the regional level, culverts are being retrofitted to ensure optimum performance for flood control and water supply functions. The most ambitious projects are the building of reservoir-assisted stormwater treatment areas. These treatment areas are dual purpose. First, they capture and store water in deep areas then treat it in shallow constructed wetlands operated to remove phosphorus. Managing lake levels to avoid extremes while allowing for seasonal fluctuations plays a major role in keeping the lake healthy. Water managers rely on improved climate forecasting, resulting in smarter decision making, when to hold and when to release water. However, projects such as reservoirs and other facilities that increase water storage outside the lake will offer reliable long-term solutions. Aquifer Storage and Recovery, or ASR, is a technology now being tested in pilot projects. It involves storing fresh water underground and could be effective in relieving the dependence on Lake Okeechobee for water storage. While Florida's recent drought was a troublesome event, it did provide a window of opportunity for the lake. Extremely low water levels made possible the planting of native vegetation along the shoreline, and a mound or berm consisting of dead plants and organic debris was removed from along the west side of the lake. Bulldozers and front-end loaders worked on the lake bottom between Indian Prairie Canal and Buckhead Ridge to break up this problematic berm. Caused by winds and unnaturally high water levels, the berm was blocking 14,000 acres of productive marsh from the open water. Work remains to be done on removing and controlling invasive exotic plants within the dike. Like any weed, these invasive exotics require ongoing treatment each year. But the good news is that once controlled, their ecological harm can be minimized. 
Invasions of the Malaluka tree appear to be under control after years of aggressive battle. And aided by the drought, low water levels, and funding from the state legislature, torpedo grass is being rigorously treated with fire and chemicals, but still remains a problem. This is just a sampling of ongoing programs and projects to restore Lake Okeechobee. It is a massive, expensive, and time-consuming effort. But Lake Okeechobee is the heart of the matter. The lake is the centerpiece for the entire region's ecosystem restoration and water supply initiatives. South Florida Water Management District is committed to fulfilling its mission to manage and protect our water resources. The district will play a vital role in projects related to the lake and will continue to coordinate activities and conduct studies with our partners, universities, nonprofit organizations, and local, state, federal, and tribal agencies. Can we do it? Can we restore this dynamic lake ecosystem and ensure the continuation of its inherent values? With time, money, determination, persistence, and strong will, we can.